Well, good morning again. Very happy to be here with you, and uh, I hope you had a blessed uh, weekend and a blessed week. Uh, a group of us got back last night, late last night, from uh, the G3 conference in Atlanta, Georgia, and it was a, a great blessing to be there and to be fed uh, by all these faithful men who proclaimed the Word of God, a lot of fellowship, a lot of time together spent in the Word and in song and in prayer, and, uh, but we're glad to be back. We're so glad to be here this morning. And so if you have your Bible, go ahead and open it to Matthew 6. Matthew 6, I'll get to the verses in a moment. As you know, the next book in our agenda as a church is the book of Romans, the epistle of Paul to the Romans. And if you're visiting with us this morning, uh, the approach that we take to Scripture uh, in this church is that we preach expository, verse-by-verse -verse sermons. We start in verse 1 of chapter 1 in a book, and then our, we make our way through that book verse-by-verse -verse until we finish the book. However, uh, we are going to take a few weeks and do a few standalone messages to give me some time to uh, prepare for Romans and to catch my breath. And, and so we are going to spend time in some not random, uh, I wouldn't say they're random topics, but, but they are not linked in, in any one book. And in particular today, what I want to bring our attention to is a message from Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6, which uh, is found in the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is the most famous sermon uh, to be preached by the greatest man to have ever walked this earth, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Sermon on the Mount is found in Matthew chapters 5 and 6 and 7. And it is a sermon which, in which Jesus is teaching his disciples uh, how to live life in a manner that is pleasing to God. That is, in essence, one of the main points of the Sermon on the Mount. Someone has said, a few people have actually said, that the entire sermon is an exposition on repentance. On repentance. At the chapter before, Matthew 4, verse 17, Jesus enters into the scene in His ministry, and the first word out of His mouth is the word, repent. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And so many have said that this sermon is an exposition. It explains what repentance looks like. And Jesus in this sermon is saying, stop living this way, live this way. This is how unbelievers live, but you are to live in this way. This is how you are to carry yourself throughout this life. Needless to say, it is a highly practical sermon covering a wide range of topics. And the topic I want to address specifically this morning is the topic of anxiety and the topic of worry. Anxiety and worry. And so the title for this sermon is The Cure for Anxiety. The Cure for Anxiety. How do we define anxiety? How do we define worry? Anxiety or worry is the preoccupation with the future. It is fear of what could happen in our lives or the lives of our loved ones. It, it is this fear that grips us of, of the dangers that might be present in the future. Consequences for decisions we have made or things that just, that just grip our hearts because we know that we do not know the outcome. Anxiety, fear, Worry, all of these are tied together, all of these emotions. Uh, I looked up some stats in the internet, and I found this, uh, and I looked at a few, and, and they all say essentially the same thing. It is said that about 28% of adults of ages 30 and over deal with anxiety. 42% of youth, 18 to 29, have anxiety. 36% of children, 13 to 18, have anxiety. But, but I think those are just people that have entered into some kind of a study, that, you know, that have some kind of a, a clinical condition. 
I would, I would wager that more than that, more than that is true. That, that most people, if not all people, suffer anxiety to one degree or another. Some people are more anxious and given to worry than other people, right? Some people are given to worry than others. It's a problem that many wrestle with to varying degrees. In fact, Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, Quote, Nothing seems to be more natural to mankind in this world than to become anxious, to become burdened and worried. And the scriptures confirm that statement, don't they? All we need to do is to go to the book of Psalms and, and how often do we see the psalmist crying out to God in anxious despair? For example, Psalm 43, verse 5, Why are you in despair, O my soul? Why are you disturbed within me? Notice the Bible points out that anxiety and worry is not particular to the unbeliever. Godly people deal with this issue as well. To give you another example, you have the prophet Elijah, 1 Kings chapter 18, and you have that great standoff between Elijah and the 450 prophets of Baal and that great victory that God has given him. And then the very next chapter, 1 Kings 19, Elijah is anxious, worried, and afraid of who? Of a woman, Jezebel that she's going to kill him. How can you go from such a point of, of a spiritual high where you witness God throw fire down from heaven and consume a sacrifice, and then you slaughter 450 prophets of Baal, that great victory, to the next day, oh, surely I'm going to die at the hands of this woman. Isn't that true of all of us? Isn't it? Haven't you experienced such a, a joyful, spirit-filled, godly experience in your life and you were in this spiritual high and then the very next day or two days you hit a low. You're, you become anxious. You become worried. Afraid. Worry, anxiety. Have you ever experienced it? Have you ever experienced it? Am I going to have a job next week? What's going to become of my children when they grow up in this godless culture? Is the government going to steal my freedoms? What's the doctor going to tell me when I go visit? What's going to be the results to that test? Anxiety, worry. Is this plane going to land? Right? More immediate? Is the pilot awake in the cockpit? Am I going to finish the sermon before Sunday? Maybe that's just mine. There are those who are worried and anxious even when their life is seemingly perfect. They have a job, they have, they have a good home, a healthy family, they have a house and car, transportation, health insurance, everything. Nevertheless, they're always anxious, always worried. Surely doom is around the corner. Do we know people like that? In fact, it's interesting, Jay Adams said this, that the greatest problem in the United States is this issue of anxiety. And I looked it up online and I looked at all the countries that deal the most with anxiety. And the United States was pretty high up. Even though we have it all. And it said in that article, some of the richest countries deal with anxiety, are the highest in rate of anxiety and worry and fear. How can that be? Well, because it doesn't matter what you have you can still struggle with this issue, right? Anxiety and worry. And so this is a very common experience. And, and the question then for us is, how do we deal with it? How do we deal with anxiety? How, how do we get rid of it? How do we cure it? 
Or put more positively, how can I arrive at a place in my life where I am at rest, where I have peace, when I am still in whatever situation I'm in? That's one answer, yes. You're getting ahead of me there. Well, thankfully, God does not leave us without an answer. God does not leave us without a solution. And what we see in Matthew here, in Matthew 6, is that Jesus doesn't just acknowledge that this is real. He tells us how to rid, get rid of it, how to deal with this issue. And he does so in Matthew 6, verses 25 to 34. Matthew 6, verses 25 to 34. And so if you have your Bible, let's go ahead and read this passage before we dig into it. Matthew 6, 25 to 34. Jesus says, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin, and yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But, I, but if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more do for you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what will I eat? What will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. There are three points I want to give you this morning. Three points. Three headings. And in this passage, Jesus tells us three things. He tells us to stop doing something. He gives us reasons as to why we're to stop doing that. And then he tells us what to do instead. So, so heading number one is this. Stop being worried. Stop being worried. It is a command. Stop being worried. Look at verse 25. Jesus says, for this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And so to begin here, Jesus simply says, stop being worried. Stop being anxious. And Jesus says this in the form of an imperative. In other words, this is not a suggestion that Jesus is giving. This is a command. It's a command. And we find this command three times in this chapter. Now, now if, if I came to you and, and told you, stop, stop worrying about your life. Stop worrying about whatever it is that's making you anxious. Well, you could say to me, well, who are you to tell me this? Right? Right? What authority do you have to tell me to stop worrying? And I tell you, I have no authority to tell you that. But Jesus does. Right? Verse 25. Look how, look how he begins. I say to you. I say to you. This is the incarnate Son of God giving a command to his disciples. I say to you, and he has every authority to tell us what to do in our lives. And he says, do not be 
worried. And notice another aspect of this verb. It's actually in the original language in the present tense. And so Jesus is not saying, don't worry today. He's actually saying, don't ever be worried. Do not ever be worried. Not today, not tomorrow, not in the future. And so what Jesus is doing here in, the, in, this, in this passage is he's shifting people's focus away from the material and into the spiritual. Because by saying this, he's he's making them uh, focus on what's truly important. Don't worry about your lives. Running around frantically anxious about what we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, what we're going to put on. Notice that these are the, the basic necessities of life. Without food, without water, without clothing, we cannot survive. We cannot survive. And in Jesus' day, there were no government programs to help people. There were no organizations to come alongside the poor and to feed them. And so these were very real concerns for many of the people that were living or that were listening to Jesus when he was preaching the sermon. And here comes Christ. He tells them, stop being so preoccupied with all of this. Enough of being anxious. And then he asks the question, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? This is a rhetorical question. By asking this, Jesus is telling them something. Life is more than stuff. Life is more than food. Life is more than than clothing. Shifting their focus away from preoccupation. But, But notice what he's not doing here. He's not saying that these things are not necessary or important. What Jesus is saying is that worry and concern for these things is what is unnecessary. The worry is what is unnecessary. The anxiety is what needs to to be done away with. Now, people in this country, all of us here, I would say, are probably not all that concerned about what we're going to eat or wear tomorrow. Right? Right? Our tendency in this country, the problem that we have, rather, is what Jesus addresses before this passage in Matthew 6, 24, where he said, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. I would say that's a greater problem for us in the United States. That we want more and more and more, and it's never enough. It's never enough, and and so it's idolatry. We're not serving God as master, we're serving wealth. And it's at the heels of that that Jesus says, stop worrying about stuff. And so for the people in, in Matthew 6, 24, they were probably concerned about amassing wealth. And now he's switching to the people in this context who had no wealth who were preoccupied with food and with water and with clothing. Where are all these things going to come from? Jesus says, life is more than daily physical necessities. And so he commands, don't worry. But then he also gives reasons why we are not to worry. In other words, Jesus does not just expect blind obedience here. He gives us reasons. He gives us arguments why we're not to worry. And he gives us four reasons in this passage. And he uses uh, illustrations from nature, and he asks some questions, as he often did, to, to bring this lesson to life. And so the second heading I want to give you is four reasons why you are not to worry in life. Four reasons why you are not to worry in life. I don't know if that the air is on, but it's pretty hot up here. Four reasons why you are not to worry in life. Reason number one, you shouldn't worry or be anxious because God will feed you. 
because God will feed you. That's what we find in verse 26. Look at verse 26. Jesus says, Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. He gives an illustration here. He says, the birds of heaven are not anxious about food. Right? And they're not sowing or reaping or storing in barns. They're not anxious about where the next meal is going to come from. Why? Because the birds know, hey, God is going to take care of it. He makes sure that there is food for us. Right? And notice what Jesus says. He says, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. He doesn't say their heavenly Father. Your heavenly Father feeds the birds. The Father provides everything they need to survive. He feeds them. It doesn't mean that birds don't do anything. Right? It doesn't mean that birds are just waiting for food to appear from thin air. Right? And then to eat it? No, they work for it. They look for the worm. Right? Well, it's the same with us. It's the same with us. We have to work. Second Thessalonians 3.10 says, For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. This is Paul speaking. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. The point is, the birds aren't anxious. They don't worry. They know there's food that's going to be provided. But that doesn't excuse laziness on their part. That doesn't excuse laziness on their part. And so we must do our part to have food and drink. But after we do that, after we work, instead of worrying, we trust God. We trust God to provide. And what Jesus is not teaching here either, by the way, is that it is sinful to plan for the future, to store for the future, to save up, right? There are many Proverbs that talk about this. The problem is doing these things in the wrong manner, with the wrong attitude, with anxiety and anxiety and worry. And then Jesus asks another question in verse 26 at the very end. Are you not of much more value than they are? Human beings are created in the image of God. Animals are not. Animals are not. Human beings are the crown jewel of God's creation. Animals are not. Animals do not have an eternal Spirit, the human being, is much more valuable and important than the animal. And so here's the simple argument. Jesus says, do you really think that if your heavenly Father is going to feed these birds that are just some simple animals without an eternal spirit, that He is going to then leave you without your needs? Right? That that He's going to forget about you? He is your father, not theirs. He feeds them. Do you think he's not going to do the same for you? Very simple argument, right? He says, don't worry because your father will feed you. And so this is all about changing the way that we think, changing the mindset. The God who created life gives life sustains life, right? If he gave you life, he will also see to it that he sustains it. The second reason Jesus gives is this. You should not worry because worry is useless. Worry is useless, verse 27. He asks, and who of you being worried can add a single hour to his life? Now, some translations say, uh, who can add a single span to their height, right? Because the Greek word here with a span could apply to either length of time or length of of height or, or space, okay? But I believe here Jesus is talking about adding time to our life. You can't prolong your life by being worried. Worry in, in, in opposition to that 
actually steals life. It doesn't add time to your lives, it takes it up. And so time spent being worried is wasted time. Time spent being worried is wasted time. There are hours of your life that you won't get back. They have already been lost. They're already past. Anxiety harms. It does not heal. And I I was in this conference on the sovereignty of God this past week, and I was walking around where they had the merchandise, and I found this pamphlet by, by Jay Adams that says, what do you do when you worry all the time? And he points out that actually being worried can, can put ulcers on the stomach. It, it affects you physically. It zaps your vitality. It robs you of life. It is harmful. It doesn't add life. It robs you of life. It robs you of time. It robs you of opportunity. And so Jesus says, what is the point of of wasting time thinking about what could happen? Worried about life, worried about this or that, it has no point. There's no benefit. There's no benefit. Ask yourself this question, when was worrying about, when has worrying about blank ever helped the situation? Ever. Ever. When has being anxious about whatever situation you were in actually helped you in that situation? Was of actual benefit? Perfectly reasonable arguments, and I think we all agree with that. C.H. Spurgeon said this, I think you know the quote, Worry does not rid tomorrow of its problems, but it does rob today of its strength. Worry does not rid tomorrow of its problems, but it does rub, rob today of its strength. Worry is not productive in any way whatsoever. It takes out life. It takes you out of the game. It paralyzes you. It robs you of time, health, opportunity, and advancement. The third reason he gives we find in verse 29 to 30. The third reason you shouldn't worry is because God will clothe you. God will clothe you. Look at verse 29. And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. And so Jesus is arguing in parts here. God God says he provides food, and included in that is water. And now he says God provides clothing. And so why are you worried about these things? He's, He's arguing in parts. It's not likely that many of us, again, are worried about these things. Especially if you belong to this church and you have a church family that would quickly come alongside you and help to feed you and clothe you if you were ever in that situation. However, the point here is simply this. We don't wrestle with food or clothing. The point is simply this. God will care for what you need. Okay? Key word is need. Not what you want. Not what you think you need. But God will give you what He knows you need. And sometimes what God knows that we need is not what we think we need. Amen? He will care for what you need for what you need. Then Jesus uses another simple illustration from nature. Look at the flowers, he says, verse verse 29. Look at the flowers. Look at the lilies. Excuse me, verse 28. Look at the lilies of the field, how they grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. And yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory is clothed himself like one of these. Solomon was the greatest king in Israel's history. He had the most wealth. He was the wisest king. He had the most 
power. He was not someone who was anxious about these things. And obviously, he clothed himself in majesty with majestic robes. And yet Jesus says, not even the richest king in the Israel's history clothed himself better than God clothes the grass of the field. Notice how he went from lilies to grass. Not even the grass that is here today and gone tomorrow is clothed better or worse than Solomon. Why? Because the grass is clothed by God, the Creator. He he dresses His creation with a garment more glorious than what a man could make or wear. I heard this illustration once. I don't know if it's actually true. So I was wrestling with, should I even say it? But I was told once that they took a piece of clothing and they they looked at it under a microscope, right? And then they took a flower and did the same thing. And the clothing looked like nothing, garbage. And the flower had such beautiful design under that enhanced view. Could that be in view here? I don't know. I don't know. But he says that the grass of the field that is here today and burned tomorrow is is clothed better. And then he says in verse 30, And if God thus clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you or do for you men of little faith? How much more will God do for you, His child, than He does for a field? Right? And He says, men of little faith. There's the problem that we have. Right? There's the problem that we have. Little faith. What is faith? Faith is believing in God and what He says. It's very practical. Faith is trusting God. Faith says He has taken care of me today. I know He will take care of me tomorrow. Faith says, I see that my circumstances are not good right now, but I know that God is on my side and that He has a plan and that He will help me and provide for my needs. He will deliver me. And even even if He doesn't deliver me, Then as Paul said in 2 Timothy 4.18, I am certain that He will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to His heavenly kingdom. Faith says this with Job, that though He slay me, I will trust in Him. Trust in God. Faith. When we read the Gospels, when we read the Epistles, where did most of the problems that the, that the disciples had, where did those come from? Little faith, right? When they had a little faith, when they were struggling, when they were doubting. In Matthew 8, 26, when they're, when they're on the boat and Jesus is asleep and there's a huge storm and they wake Him up, uh, Lord, we're perishing, save us. And what does Jesus do? He gets up. He rebukes the storm. He rebukes the waves. He rebukes the wind. And then He turns to them. And Jesus doesn't say, yeah, that was pretty scary, guys. You you know, yeah. Thanks for waking me up. We almost died. Whew. No, He rebukes them. O oh, you of little faith, right? He rebukes them. Don't you know who is in the boat with you? Don't you know that the one in the boat with you is the one who created this sea? Who sends the storm? Who created the universe by the power of His Word? Right? It was a lack of faith in who he was. Maybe not a lack. He says little. Little faith. And that's often us, isn't it? 
But the great news is that even if you have a little faith in the right object, a little faith will do. Because it's the object of your faith that saves you, not how strong your faith is. But we struggle as Christians when we have little faith. Storm again, storm. Jesus is walking on water. Peter, if it's you, Lord, tell me to come to you. Okay, come. What happens? He begins to walk on water. Why? His eyes were set on Christ. And then what happens? He sees the waves and the storm, and he looks at that. And what happens? He sings. Lord, save me. Again, does, does he save him? Of course. But then he rebukes him. Why did you doubt? You little faith. You took your eyes off of me. That's the problem. You took your eyes off of Christ, Peter. That's when we struggle, right? The contrast with the Apostle Paul, he, he's imprisoned in Rome and he writes Philippians from jail. He's imprisoned. He had every right to be anxious and worried. He says, I don't know if I'm going to live or die. Right? And then in chapter 4, he says, I'm content. It's the epistle of joy. I am rejoicing exceedingly, he says. I'm not worried about, is my head getting chopped off tomorrow? Or am I going to be freed? Why? Because Paul had a single focus. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ. He had a big Christ, and so he could deal with his emotions. He could deal with his anxiety. He could deal with his worry. Oh, you of little faith. He provides food. He provides clothing. It's useless. Re reason number four. The fourth reason you are not to worry is because worry is inconsistent with being a child of God. Worry is inconsistent with being a child of God. Again, Jesus commands the people in verse 31. Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat, or what we will, will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? Verse 32, for the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, but your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. The Gentiles, when we read the Bible, a Jew and a Gentile, a Gentile could be anyone that was a non-Jew. Okay? But in other contexts, a Gentile is an unbeliever. Not a person of God. That's what we find in this context. He's talking about an unbeliever. The Gentiles are worried about these things. They're running around all frantic, asking these questions. What are we going to eat? What will we drink? What will we wear for clothing? The Gentile is an unbeliever. And an unbeliever has every reason to be anxious, every reason to be worried, every reason to be afraid. Why? Because they do not have God in their life. They are without God and without hope in the world, as Paul says in Ephesians. They have no heavenly Father caring for them. And so, of course, they're going to run around worried about all these things. Where's my next meal going to come from? Of course they're going to run around. They live for this life. They live for this world and the things of this world. For stuff. Amassing riches here on earth, where it's all going to perish, where it's all going to fade away. Whereas before Jesus said these words here, he said, no, store up for yourself treasures in heaven. Treasures in heaven. All that the unbeliever has is a life of anxiety and worry. He is alone in this world. She is alone in this world. And all that's left for them is to live and to eat and to drink and to party and to die and to stand before God and to be judged for their sins. That's all they have. 
That's all they have. They worry. They have every reason to worry. Right? But Jesus says, but you, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. And so it's inconsistent with being a child of God. We, we shouldn't ask these anxious questions because God is our Father. He knows what we need. Look at verse 8 of Matthew uh, 6. Matthew 6, let me read 7 and 8. <clears throat> Matthew 6, 7 and 8. He says, And when you're praying... Do not use meaningless, meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, unbelievers, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Verse 8, So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Don't, don't pray these vain, repetitious, mindless prayers. Right? Asking God the same thing over and over and over again? Ask once. And He even knows what you need before you ask. We're still to ask, but He knows. And one of the most comforting things for the saint, for a child of God, is this doctrine of the omniscience of God. That God knows all things. That God knows you personally and intimately. He knows all your needs. He knows all your anxieties and concerns and your worries. He knows all of your sins that you've committed and that you will commit. And He still loves you. He still saved you. Isn't that amazing? You can't take God by surprise. The problems in your life and in my life are not catching him unawares. He's in control. He knows, right? Your heavenly Father. This is where studying the attributes of God comes in so handy. Knowing who God is. Your heavenly Father not only knows all things, He's also sovereign, in control of all things. And He has all resources to help you, to give you what you need. And not only does He know and does He have the resources, He also has the power to make it happen. To care for you. It's an amazing thing. To know God. To know who He is. Paul knew his God. That's why he wasn't anxious. That's why he wasn't worried. And if you are his son or his daughter, he cares for you. He provides for your needs sovereignly. This illustration I read in this pamphlet, i got to read it to you. Same pamphlet by Jay Adams. <laughs> it's like half my sermon. <clears throat> Joe's friends all knew him as a warrior. Warrior. No, not a warrior is in fight. He's worried. It's my accent. One day Bill saw his worrying friend bouncing along as happy as a man could be, whistling and humming and wear, wearing a huge smile, and he looked as if he did not have a care in the world, and Bill could hardly believe his eyes. And so he asked his friend, Joe, what has happened to you? He asked, You don't seem worried anymore. It's wonderful, Bill said. I have been worried for several weeks now. That's great. How did you manage it? He asked. And Joe explained, Well, I hired a man to do all the worrying for me. <laughs> what? The other guy says, right? Well, Bill mused, I must say that that is a new wrinkle. I don't know what that means. That's odd, maybe. Tell me how much does he charge you? He says $1,000 a week. $1,000 a week? How could you possibly raise $1,000 a week to pay him? Joe answered, that's his worry. <laughs> Saints, we have someone that can carry our burdens for free. Our friend quoted it earlier in the sermon. 1 Peter 5.7 Cast all your anxieties upon Him because He cares for you. Cast your anxieties. 
Throw them upon God. Let him worry about it. Let him worry about it. He is a good father. The God who is keeping the universe in place by his word is your father. So don't worry because God provides your needs. Don't worry because it's useless and because it's inconsistent with being his child. Well, the last question we need to address is what are we to do? What should we do instead of worrying? Because Jesus doesn't just tell us what not to do, it's, it's also what we have to do. The Christian life is much more than just putting off and killing sin in our lives. The Christian life is also putting on. What am I to do instead? What am I to think of instead? Right? What ought to be my concern? Well, Jesus tells us, third and final heading, what you should do or must do instead of worrying. What you must do instead of worrying. Verse 33, Jesus says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Instead of worrying about stuff and life and the necessities of life, do this instead, Jesus says. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. I want you to notice a few very important things here. Number one, notice that again, this is not a suggestion. This is another command. And so in this passage, we find a negative command and a positive command. Negatively, stop worrying. Do not worry. He says it three times in this passage. Positively, he says this, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Second, notice that this word seek is in the present tense. Worry is in the present tense. Do not worry ever. Seek is in the present tense. Always be seeking. Okay? Every day of your life, you need to be seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness. This is a lifestyle that Jesus is calling us to. So often we fail in our goals. I'm thinking of like New Year's resolutions. Why? Because in our mind, it's like, this is what I'm going to do for three months, and then I'm going to be fit and healthy the rest of my life. Don't work that way. It's a lifestyle change, right? That's why Jesus is saying here, stop worrying, start living this way. Start living this way, okay? Number three, notice the word first. And this doesn't mean do this first in, in, in order, but this is the priority. This is the priority in your Christian life. Again, I remind you, it's not that Jesus says not to work for what we need. What Jesus is saying here, work Food, water, clothing, job, whatever it may be, is not the priority. It's not the priority. The priority is to seek the kingdom and his righteousness. Now, what does that mean? To seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Well, a kingdom has a king, and a kingdom has subjects. Guess who the king is? God, right? And, and saints are the subjects. And so to live and to seek the kingdom of God, to live for and to seek the kingdom of God is essentially to do his will, to live for the will of God. And Jesus says that again, actually, in Matthew 7, not all who say to me, Lord, Lord, will enter, but those who do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. Right? And so it's to live for the will of God. This involves seeking God in fervent prayer. It involves seeking Him in His Word, renewing our minds. It involves serving His people in the context of the local church. It involves using our spiritual gifts. So many saints do not use their spiritual gift. So many saints, I'm not, I'm not thinking about any particular church, I'm just talking in general. So many saints fail to use their spiritual gift. You have a spiritual gift, at least one. Living for the will of God involves using that for His glory and the building up of His church. This involves 
replacing the bad with the good, cutting sin out of your life, replacing it with good works, right? Seeking first the kingdom involves applying this entire sermon, being a light in the world, right? Uh, do not lust, do not commit adultery in the heart, a pray and fast, give to those who ask. That is what it means to live for the will of God. It means using your resources, your finances, your energy to serve God and to do the work He has given you to do. And in essence and in summary, it is to fulfill His great commission. This is how the sermon ends, doesn't it? That's how the, or how the excuse me, the, the gospel ends. Go into all nations and make disciples from those nations, baptizing those disciples, and then teaching those disciples to obey all that I've commanded. Right? That is the summary of the Christian mission. And so what Jesus is saying here is live for the world to come. Not for this world. Set your mind and your eyes on the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. This world is not our home. But what does and also His righteousness mean? Two things we're seeking. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. There are people who say commentators who say that this is that we need to seek the righteousness of God as in the context of salvation. Okay? The, the righteousness of Christ that covers us and which we need to stand before God in heaven apart from judgment. But I don't think this is what Jesus is talking about because he's already made a differentiation between Gentiles and his disciples right before this verse. So what I believe Jesus is saying here is that we are to live and pursue a lifestyle that reflects God's righteousness. That reflects His righteousness. To be a light, as He already pointed out in Matthew 5. This is what He meant when He said that we hunger and thirst for righteousness. Be holy, for I am holy. Pursue His righteousness. Reflect His righteousness. The kingdom of God is marked out by righteous living. I think that fits into the context of the sermon being an exposition on repentance. Because there's a righteousness that the world tells us is right, and then there's the righteousness of God. But so you don't get the wrong idea, and this is very important. Jesus, I don't believe, is teaching, in fact, I know he's not, in the sermon that we can live a perfect life or achieve a level of perfection. And yet in Matthew 5, he said, you must be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. And so the Sermon on the Mount, what does it do to us? It shows us this is impossible I cannot live this perfectly. I need the righteousness of another, right? It points us to Christ. It points us to the fact that you cannot go to heaven by your own good works or religion. You need to go to heaven by the merits of another person, by his righteousness. And that's only Jesus Christ. That's only Christ. And so, yes, Jesus acknowledges we, we struggle with these things. These are not good things. But it also reminds us of our need for a Savior. Our need for a Savior. So in summary here, Jesus is calling his disciples to live a life completely devoted to light, to God. And what's the result? What's the result when we live this way, when we seek first His kingdom and His righteousness? He tells us, he says, and all these things shall be added unto you. What are these things? The food, the water, the clothing, what we need. And so the basic principle we find here is live for God, focus on His will, not your earthly needs, and God will take care of your earthly needs. 
Live for the will of God, and He'll take care of your physical needs. And then Jesus concludes quickly with one final reason. He, he's summarizing everything in verse 34 as to why we shouldn't worry. Verse 34, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. When we're worried, it's always future-focused, right? It's always on the day of tomorrow, right? Or later today. It's always future focus. Our imagination begins to act up. We start thinking about bad things that could happen. Before we went to the conference, I was like, what if this plane crashes on my way back, on our way back? I, that thought went through my mind. I don't know why, right? It's just always what could happen. What could happen? But we have to understand this. God gives you and I the grace we need for that day. He will give you the grace you need for the challenge of that day. Tomorrow, He'll give you the grace you need for those challenges. Okay? But today, He gives us what we need. And so God doesn't promise that evil won't come, that difficult times won't come, that the job we want, we want will be given to us, the news we want. But he does promise to give us the grace that will match that challenge. The grace that we'll need. Let tomorrow worry about itself. This is God's way of saying, live in the present. Live in the present. Because you don't know what tomorrow will bring. In fact, you don't even know if there is a tomorrow. So James says. But instead, we should plan this way. If the Lord wills, we will do this or that or go here and there. If He wills. Three times He commands, do not worry. I need to point this out. I know we're going a little long today. Three times He commands, do not worry. This is God speaking. If we worry, what, what does that make worry? A sin. Right? We're not obeying a command from God. It means anxiety, worry, is actually a sin. We have to call it what it is. I struggle with worry and anxiety. My wife could tell you. But I'm not going to pretend it's, it's struggling. Right? Right? O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Right? Why did you doubt? J. Adams says, anxiety and worry is the American sin. It's the American sin. So we have to repent of anxiety. Change our mindset. Stop thinking one way and begin to think another way. We need to stop setting our minds on the things that make us anxious and set them on the task at hand, what God has given you to do today. When we fail to do that, this is what we're doing. This is what we're saying by our actions. Okay? God, I don't believe your word. I don't believe you'll take care of my needs tomorrow. I don't believe that you know what I need. I don't believe that you're sovereign. I don't believe that you care for me and so I can cast my anxiety upon you. And what we become is, is not that we lose our salvation, that we're not Christians, but what, it, what that's called is practical atheism. Practical atheism. We believe in God, we've trusted in Christ for salvation, but we live life as if He does not exist. Right? Right? We have to be so careful and, and go to God in repentance when that happens and increase our faith. More faith defeats fear, anxiety, and worry. More faith in God. Now in this town, we have, in conclusion here, 
this creature called Zozobra. And I don't know if you know what the word means. The word Zozobra means worry and anxiety. It means worry and anxiety. Okay? In an article, I think it's Wikipedia, it's very trustworthy. Sounds right. It says the Zozobra, also known as Old Man Gloom, is a giant marionette effigy constructed of wood, wire, and cotton cloth that is built and burned prior to the annual Fiestas de Santa Fe in Santa Fe, New Mexico, United States. It stands 50 feet high. As its name suggests, it embodies gloom and anxiety. By burning it, people destroy the worries and troubles of the previous year in the flames. Anyone that has an excess of gloom is encouraged to write down the nature of their gloom on a slip of paper and leave it in the gloom box found in the city of Santa Fe Visitor Center in the weeks leading up to the burning. Participants can also add documents on the day of burning up until 8 p.m. As a gloom, at a gloom tent. Sounds nice. In the, in the venue where they can add to the marionette's stuffing, legal papers, divorce documents, mortgage payoffs, parking tickets, and even a wedding dress, all have been found in the Sozobra and go up in smoke. At the festival, glooms from the gloom box are placed at the Sozobra's feet to be burned alongside it. That's witchcraft to me. It's superstition. A spiritual problem cannot be resolved with man-made methods or superstitions. And worry and anxiety is a spiritual problem because it is a sin. But the Word of God promises you and I that if we go to Christ, confess our sins, even of worry and anxiety, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, cleanse us of all unrighteousness, of all unrighteousness. And that includes anxiety and worry. And so if you're here this morning and you're bound and chained to this sin and all other sin, Christ invites you to come to him this very moment and to place your faith upon him, and he will rid you of all sin and give you eternal life, the Holy Spirit, and a peace that surpasses understanding. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time, for your word. We thank you for direction in life. Thank you for helping me to go through this passage even if in weakness and with imperfect words, I, I pray that you would use it in the lives of your people and that you would use this sermon to convict someone here of their sin, to forgive them and save them this very moment. And we ask in the name of Jesus, amen.